All right, hi everyone, and welcome to the second seminar of Learn to Hunt Spring Gobblers. My name is Ken Duran, and I am the Game Bird Section Supervisor with the Pennsylvania Game Commission. I will be starting us out today by talking about some basic turkey biology and why learning about their biology can help you be successful in the spring woods. Then I'm gonna hand it over to Steve Smith, who's gonna give you some tips on scouting for turkeys so that you will be ready when the season starts. All right, let's start with learning how to identify the sex and age of turkeys. Starting with males, one of the most visible differences from females is the color of their heads. Male turkeys are patriotic. They have red, white, and blue heads. During the spring, particularly if he is really worked up and excited, these colors are gonna be very bright and you can see them from a long ways away. Female turkeys or hens will have dull blue heads and their, head, and their feathers come further up their neck. The color of the breast feathers is another reliable indicator of sex. Males will have black tips on the edge of their feathers, of their breast feathers, and for females, they're going to have light brown tips on their breast feathers. This color difference will make males look darker from a distance than females. Finally, males have a claw on their legs called spurs, and hens do not. Spurs grow longer with age. A young male, or Jake, will have spurs less than half an inch long. An old male, which can be called a gobbler, or tom, long beard, long beard, or many other names, will have spurs that can grow to over an inch and a half. You will obviously have to be pretty close to a turkey to see its spurs, so you shouldn't rely on this to determine the age and sex of a bird from a distance. While spurs can be helpful in aging turkeys, the most reliable and easiest way is to look at the tail fan. The middle tail feathers of jakes are longer than the rest of the tail feathers. Those feathers are easy to see when the turkey is strutting. The picture on the left shows two jakes in full strut. You can see those middle tail feathers sticking out above the rest. Now the picture on the right shows two gobblers and their tail feathers are all the same size. Now, some of you may be wondering why I haven't talked about beards yet. It's because the beards are not a perfectly reliable indicator of turkey sex. Let's look at this turkey. You can see that it has a beard, but if you look at the legs, you don't see spurs, and the head doesn't have any red or white coloring on it. This turkey is a bearded hen, and around 9% of hens grow beards, and many jakes can have really small beards, around one or two inches that you may not actually be able to see from a distance. So relying on that beard is, is not the best way to determine the sex of a turkey. Now, beard isn't a perfect indicator of sex. It is still very important for the spring turkey season because during the spring season, you can only harvest a turkey with a beard. That's very important to remember. Um, it is only legal to harvest a turkey with a beard. Now let's do a quick test of what you've learned so far. Uh, think about how many gobblers, jakes, and hens you see in this picture, and then how many of those would be legal to harvest in the spring. Now before I provide the answer, I wanna pause and say, I really hope that you have the fortune to encounter the scenario one day in the field. Four birds in full strut is really gonna get your heart racing and start that turkey hunting addiction. So the answer is that four turkeys on the right are males and the one on the left is a hen. You can really see the color differences of the heads. Bright red, bright white on those males and the, the female is just that dull blue, blue head. Now in terms of age, if you look at those three turkey fans, you can see that they're, the, all the feathers are the same length. So all those are gobblers. Uh, we can't really see the fan of the third of the fourth male, um, so you can't really determine what sex it is. But it does have a very long beard, as do all the other, all all four of those gobblers. So you know that all four of those gobblers are legal to harvest in the spring. And the hen doesn't have a beard, so that would be illegal to harvest her. And finally, uh, just want to pause and say that if you are do encounter this situation, those gobblers are all pretty close together. You may want them to spread out more to make sure you have a safe shot on just one of them. 
So that's all for Turkey ID. Let's switch now to biology. And what makes the spring season so unique? First, the spring turkey hunting season is the only season that is open in May, except for coyote season, which is never closed. And what makes this season fun and why we can have the season is that the spring is the breeding season for turkeys. Males become territorial and form a harem of hens to mate with. Starting around the beginning of March, you start to see gobblers strutting, hearing them gobble, and occasionally you'll get to see them get in fights. Ultimately, what motivates gobblers during this time is attracting hens. This is one of the most important aspects for you to know as a hunter. Understanding what hens do and sound like can be very important to your success. Hens are also vital to maintaining turkey populations over time. Turkeys don't form pairs like geese or other birds. You won't see a gobbler bring food to a hen, sit on a nest, or even be associated with the young turkeys. Hens do all the work, so protecting them from the, during the breeding season is important. That's why you can only shoot bearded turkeys during the spring season. Most turkeys with beards are males, so that regulation protects, provides protection for over 90% of the hens in the turkey population. Also, the behavior of males, turkeys, makes them more susceptible to harvest from hunters. Again, gobblers are looking for hens, so they will come to hen calls or decoys. Hen turkeys are not as interested in coming to other hen turkeys, so you are less likely to call on a hen than a gobbler. One additional factor for protecting hens is the timing of when the spring turkey season starts. Through past research, we have found that around half of hens have started incubating eggs by the beginning of May. Incubating hens spend most of, the, most of their day sitting on nest and only occasionally leave the nest. This means they are not out in the middle of fields or very visible at all, and therefore less likely to be harvested legally or illegally. So we start the spring turkey season in Pennsylvania around the beginning of May to provide that extra protection for hens. We understand how the timing can be frustrating to hunters who are hearing gobbling and seeing strutting birds in March and April and want to start hunting early. Now I will cover how nesting timing relates to gobbling activity and how to use it to your advantage later. But for now, please remember that our late start dates is so important for protecting our turkey populations. I mentioned earlier, gobblers are spending their time trying to attract hens. And hunters are acting like hens, hoping to bring gobblers in. However, typically it's the hens that come to the gobblers and not the other way around. So you as a hunter are fighting biology. Now, if you encounter a bird like this one, surrounded by hens or what's called hen up, you will struggle to get him to, get him to come to your calls. He may gobble back at you, but he likely won't come much closer while those hens are around. Now this can be incredibly frustrating, but patience will pay off. Hens typically lay eggs and visit their nests during late mornings. If you can stay in the woods, it's likely many of these hens will leave him. Also, hens spend about two weeks laying eggs before they begin incubation. And as I said earlier, when they are incubating, they rarely leave their nest. So if you are seeing a lot of hens one week, you may not the next. For hunting, if you are seeing hens, whether that is later in the, if you aren't seeing hens, whether that is later in the day or later in the season, gobblers are seeing less hens as well. This makes them very interested in hen calls or decoys that you will use for hunting. So finding those times when there are less hens will help your success. So don't give up after the first couple of weeks in the season. If you find a gobbler in the late season, it, like, it is likely he may be desperate for anything that resembles a hen. Let's, let's move on now and talk about gobblers. They are, after all, what spring turkey hunting is all about. We'll start with gobbling. There's nothing more exciting than hear a bird gobble, and if you're close enough, it will seem like you feel it. No, knowing more about gobbling behavior will help you become a turkey hunting addict. Let's start with timing. Gobbling activity starts picking up in March and peaks in April here in Pennsylvania. Research has shown that gobbling activity increases as more hens are laying or incubating eggs. However, the start of hunting season greatly reduces gobbling activity. 
it's likely happens because turkeys are harvested and there are less birds out there gobbling. And uh, turkeys change behavior to avoid hunting. Think about it. The louder a bird is, the more likely it will be that someone tries to harvest it. Gobbling activity does vary a lot from day to day. So if you're experiencing one day with little gobbling, the next day you may hear a lot. Research has shown that around 80% of gobbling activity happens between 30 minutes prior to sunrise to two hours after sunrise. Gobbling does occur throughout the day and often when they roost at night. However, your best chance of hearing birds is early in the morning. It means a lot of gobbling happens when turkeys are on their roost. Listening to turkeys gobble on their roost can be tricky and frustrating. They often call in multiple directions, so it can sound like they are moving away and coming back even though they are in the same spot. Generally, you can hear a turkey from twice as far away when it isn't in a tree compared to the ground. When it flies down, it will sound like it is further away. The terrain, habitat, weather, and your hearing ability all impact how far away a turkey you will be able to hear a turkey. This means that a gobb as gobblers moves, he will sound closer or further away depending on the conditions are changing. So if he is going down into a ravine or coming up on top of the hill, it will sound very different. One great thing about turkeys is that you can increase how much they gobble. Turkey calls, mimicking hens or other gobblers, is one great way, and it usually will bring the bird closer. However, turkeys gobble at many other loud noises. You can bite crow or owl calls to help you locate gobblers. Turkeys won't come into a crow or owls, so these locator calls are best if you just want to know if a gobbler is nearby. Turkeys will also gobble to car horns, slamming a car door, thunder, geese, blue jays, and just loud noises in general. Now, I don't recommend taking something that sounds like a car horn out into the woods with you, but if you do have these happen while you're out there, take advantage of them. We aren't really sure why they do this, but again, it can help you when you're trying to find turkeys. Now, I mentioned earlier that turkeys call a lot from the roost. So let's talk about what roosts are. Turkeys sleep at night in trees to help them avoid predators. They will fly up into a roost tree around sunset and they often will gobble after fly flying up. If you wanna know where a gobbler will be in the morning, listen for him to gobble on the roost in the evening. Turkeys leave their roost around sunrise. However, the time they fly down can vary and the weather has a lot of influence on that. On foggy days with lower visibility, you can expect turkeys to stay up in the tree longer. The main reason for this is because turkeys are not great flyers. Think of them like you would a jumbo jet. They need space to take off and land. If anything jumps in their way as they're flying, they're probably going to crash into it. So turkeys will wait to fly down when they can see that the runway is clear. This poor flying ability also impacts where they roost. Generally, they will pick trees near areas where the ground is more open. They won't fly down into thicker, brushy areas like laurel or rhododendron patches. You can also look for roost sites near water and higher up on hills, but not at the top of the hill. When they are higher on the hill, hens and other males can hear them from further away, but the top of the hills leaves them more exposed to predators and wind. Turkeys change roost site every day. The distance between roost sites is typically around 800 yards. That means they can move on or off the property you're hunting and in and out of hearing range from day to day. So don't give up if you lose them for a day. They may be back the next. Now, once a gobbler flies down off the roost, he often heads to a strut zone where he can, where he can attract hens. Gobblers will strut and gobble from these areas, so they will be in places where he can be heard and seen from long distances. Often they are ag fields, but pipelines, transmission lines, forest clearings, hilltops, open knobs, and even forests with an open understory are great, great places to look for. Strut zones are also places where gobblers can see predators coming from a dis long distance. So if you're going to hunt one, make sure you get there before any of the turkeys do. Now, ultimately, learning about turkey behavior and what drives them will help you harvest a turkey 
and learning about their habitats will help you identify places to start looking. Spending time in the woods, watching and listening will help you learn even more about the birds in your local area. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Steve Smith so he can talk about scouting. All right, thank you for that, Ken. That was some really terrific information. And I will say from experience that the more I learned about turkeys and how they behave and the reasons for why they're doing what they're doing and why they are in the locations that they are, that they are the better turkey hunter I became. That information goes a long way towards solving the puzzle and figuring these, these birds out. And we're gonna shift gears here just a little bit now and talk about scouting. And as it stands today, uh, tonight we're about two weeks away from the youth season and a little less than three weeks away from the regular season, which means we are in the ideal time when it comes to scouting, finding some birds and getting ready to hunt. And that's really all that scouting is, is doing the, the preseason reconnaissance so that when the season starts, we're ready to go. So if you're new to turkey hunting and new to scouting, here's the process that I use when I work through a new piece of property to get ready for the season. So if I'm hunting an area that's new to me, I've never hunted it before, I don't know where the turkeys are, where they might be, or even if there's any turkeys in the area. The first thing that I'm gonna do is what I call electronic scouting. And that's by referencing programs like Google Earth, or Onyx Maps, or any other uh, platform that provides an aerial and satellite images of the property. This is gonna give me some points of reference and help me identify any landmarks that might be unique to the property. I'm looking for anything like logging roads, clearings, hiking trails, streams, et cetera. Some of the major characteristics of that property that I wanna keep in mind and know where they're at when I actually go there, which is the next step. After I've done that, I've viewed it from afar, I'm gonna walk that area during the day and spend some time looking around for sign. A couple of things in particular that I'm gonna look for. First, turkeys need to eat. And throughout the fall and in the winter, and even into the early spring, a lot of their diet consists of nuts that have fallen from trees. And here in Pennsylvania, that's primarily going to be oak trees as turkeys love eating acorns that drop from those trees uh, throughout September, October, November, and then stay on the ground throughout the fall and uh, winter months. So I'm gonna look for some mature oaks. And while doing that, I'm also looking for any sign, any indication that turkeys have been in that area doing the same thing, looking for acorns. And when, when a turkey is gonna do that, it's we refer to it as scratchings. And these are areas where the leaves have been pulled away, the ground is bare, and that's because a turkey was there looking for some acorns or some for any other nuts to eat. And he's pulled those leaves back looking for them. So if you're walking through the woods and you come to an area that literally looks like someone came through with a leaf rake and just started raking up leaves. Uh, chances are those are locations where turkeys went through and they were scratching for something to eat. Now, if I can't find any scratchings, that doesn't automatically mean that I'm ruling that area out completely. Especially if there's a field nearby or any type, any type of opening in the woods, any place where there's uh, removed from, trees have been removed from that area, there's a bare spot in the woods, anything like that, because, and that might be just an old landing spot for a logging operation, or it could be even a power line. And the benefit of those areas is as we get into the spring, as vegetation is coming out in those openings, in those fields, um, that coincides with turkeys transitioning their diet away from the the nuts that are on the ground and looking more for that green vegetation and for the insects that can be found there. So an area like that, where there's a field, an opening in the woods, that's usually worth checking out to see if turkeys have been around. 
And then ultimately, though, the best spots are the ones that combine those two characteristics. So if I can find a spot and I have several in mind that I know year in and year out, the turkeys are going to be there. These are spots where there's mature woods, there's oaks that drop acorns, and then there's a big gap in the woods. There's openings, there's a power line that comes through, or better yet, there's a field. Those, when you find an area like that, that has a lot of the characteristics, everything that a turkey needs to look for to survive, chances are if there's turkeys anywhere in the area, they're gonna be in some of those spots. So after I've done my e-scouting, my daytime scouting, and I have any reason to believe that there might be turkeys around, it is time to try to confirm that and hear where the turkeys are roosted at night. And to do that, unfortunately, it requires getting up early. And this is probably the most difficult part about scouting, as I will like to be in the woods well before the sun comes up. And what I'm doing is I'm listening for the turkeys to communicate with each other while they're still in the trees on their roost. And those vocalization, that communication typically begins as soon as uh, the horizon starts to get light, as soon as that first light comes through, those turkeys are gonna start talking to each other in the tree, in their roosting locations. And basically what's happening is you'll have the gobblers announcing that I'm here and I'm interested in mating uh, through gobbling. And then the hens reply back doing the same. And the response from the hens is usually in the form of yelping and clucking. And it's much softer to hear than a gobble. A gobble can be heard from several hundred yards away. And I will say that um, my experience has been once you hear that gobble, um, it was worth it then at that point to get up early in the morning because that's better than any cup of coffee uh, when it comes to waking up. There's just nothing like it. So it will be worth it. However, just try not to get too close. And that's my next tip is try to stay a safe distance away. You want to do your scouting at this point from afar. You're just listening for the turkeys. Are they in that location? You're not trying to see them. Because if you're close enough to see them, chances are they're close enough to see you. And that's likely what's gonna happen. We don't wanna be doing that. We don't wanna disturb the turkeys because it doesn't take much for them to move out, move out of there and find a different area if they're constantly being disturbed. So one way to make sure or decrease the chances, I should say, that you're gonna disturb turkeys is I like to get up above where I think they might be. That means getting to the top of a hill, getting to the top of a mountain, a ridge line. Uh, generally speaking, a turkey will roost down off of the edge a little bit. And when they fly down in the morning, they'll open up their wings and just kind of glide down to where they wanna be. It's unusual, generally speaking, for a turkey to turn and fly out of the roost and go uphill. And a few caveats to that is if there's a hen up above them, that can cause them to fly up. Or if it's hunting season and hopefully it's you sounding like a hen up above them, that can cause them to fly up from off the roof. But generally speaking, a turkey roosted in a tree is going to fly downward. So what I like to do is use that knowledge and get up above them and listen to where they are. Now, if I'm walking into an area don't know that there's any turkeys there for sure, don't know where they might be roosted. I'm gonna be very cautious uh, for, for that, going back to that reason, I don't wanna be disturbing them. So what I'll probably do is try to get out ahead of them uh, waiting until it gets light to gobble. And I'll try to get them gobble even a little earlier through a locator call. Um, particularly in that early morning, I'm gonna be using an owl hooter. What that does is it causes that gobbler if he's even semi-awake to do what's called a shock gobble. And they will hear a loud noise. And in the woods, it happens quite naturally from owls or from crows. And they'll hear that loud noise and they'll just gobble instantly. They're not communicating with the owl or the crow. It's just a reflexive uh, gobble that comes out. So if I'm sneaking into an area, uh, starting to get light, I haven't heard anything from where the turkeys are. I'm concerned about potentially bumping into them while they're up in the trees above me. I'm gonna use a locator call or two just to give me an idea of where they might be. Another good locator call, like I mentioned, is the crow call. Um, that's a great way to get a response from a gobble. But in the early morning, probably gonna use an owl hooter as that's uh, very natural and that's typically what 
what uh, you'll hear in the woods during that time of the day. And early on in the spring, the first couple of weeks of April, really up until this point, that's pretty much all I have done is checked out some areas, uh, spent some time there in the day, and then come up in the morning, got up in those spots just to hear that there are turkeys around or not and confirm where they might be uh, roosting from time to time. But now that we're getting closer to the season, now that it's um, less than two weeks away for the youth season, I'm going to come and pre be prepared to stay a little longer when I can. Because now I not only want to hear where they are roosting in the trees, but what I want to know is where do they go when they fly down? Because ultimately, that's the most important piece of information for me as a hunter, is where do the turkeys like to go when they hit the ground? And to do that, it simply requires listening for a longer period of time after they fly down. Because they will still gobble, but just not as frequently as they do when they're in the trees. The reason being is, uh, take this gobbler in this picture here, chances are when it got light, as soon as it got light, he started gobbling multiple times from his location, from his roost tree, and these hens probably responded to him. Uh, what he did is flew down and went into an area like this, a nice opening, we talked about that, and now he's strutting around waiting for the hens to come to him like they have. When he's doing that, he's not gonna be gobbling too much. There's no reason for him to do so. The hens all know where he is, they all know where to find him, and they're on their way. Um, so he won't be gobbling nearly as frequently as he would be if he was still roosted. It's not to say he won't gobble at all, uh, just not as frequently. And in a situation like this, again, those locator calls, a crow call as it gets later into the morning, is a great way to find those gobblers that are down on the ground, have the hens around them, um, but aren't going to gobble very much because they don't have to. That's for the what we refer to as the dominant gobblers in the flock, the ones that have hens. But there are still other gobblers around that are lower in the pecking order, not quite as mature as this as this uh, gobbler is, and they won't have hens around them. Instead, what, what they'll do is be generally hanging around the fringe of the flock, uh, waiting to see if there's any hens that don't go to the dominant bird. These gobblers will gobble uh, throughout the morning. They, they are letting the hens know that, hey, I'm still here too. If you're still looking, I'm still here. So you can hear from them as well. I would, would also add that those gobblers are a lot of fun to hunt because they're more likely to come running to a call when they think they've finally found a hen willing to mate with them. So if you listen for that hour or so after the sun comes up and after we're getting later into the morning, you're going to pick up on this information. You're going to be able to sort out where the dominant birds are with their hens and where the gobblers that don't have any hens are and are lonely are likely to hang out. All of that information is key. It's really critical. If you know where the birds like to roost, where they typically go when they fly down, you have all the information you need to hunt those turkeys. Because it's a thousand times likely to call in a gobbler that's going the direction that he wants to go than it is to try to call in a turkey that you're calling from a spot that he has no interest in going to. So use that information to your, to your advantage can really make you a successful hunter. A couple of final tips. We talked about it. It, it bears repeating though, only be using locator calls. If you're out there with a hen, hen call, box call, mouth call, you will absolutely know if there are turkeys in the area this time of year because you're going to get a response. The bad thing is you're going to get a response. You're going to educate those gobblers that when they come in that, hey, not everything that sounds like a hen really is a hen. And these turkeys are difficult enough to hunt. The last thing we need to do is make them even more skeptical, even more wary than they already really are. So let's just stick to locator calls this time of year. And then try to identify as many spots as possible. The more possible hunting locations you have, the better your, your odds are of being successful. And I included these last two pictures of gobblers that my son has been able to kill because they are 100% a product of early season scouting. The one on the left, uh, he shot that on the youth day several years back. We had uh, one pl place in mind. We had a plan A. Um, it's an area of game lands where there were multiple birds. There was a lot of hens in the area. They brought in a lot of mature gobblers, but there was a lot of those 
lonely birds that didn't have any hens that were staying around the fringe of the flock. So I knew if we went there and they were in that area, we had a really good chance of getting him a bird. However, that area bordered private land. And as luck would be that morning, uh, the, the flock was over on the private land where we did not have permission to hunt. We were on game lands. Now, if I had been by myself, I probably would have stayed there all morning and tried to wait them out. But since it was the youth day and, and I wanted to keep things more active, and we decided to try a different location. So we drove a couple miles down the road, different spot on the game lands, and I went to my plan B. I went to an area where I knew a turkey had been. Uh, we hiked back to where he generally liked to roost, and I gave a call. He responded down below me. Now, if if I didn't know better, I probably just would have sat right down there and see if I could call him in. However, I knew he had been in that area a couple hours earlier. At this point, it was around 8.30 in the morning. I knew he had probably just been here, just roosted here. Um, and it was going to be more difficult to call him back since he had just been there. So instead of what we did is packed up, made a big semicircle, got out in front of him and called, and he came right in. Because reason being, we were in the general area of where that turkey liked to go. So when we started calling to him, it sounded natural that there would be hens there and he came right in. Second turkey pictured here, this was a great hunt um, on a property that's enrolled in the Game Commission's public access program. So this is a private farm, but the farmer uh, allowed us to hunt there. And all that information regarding these, these type of properties is listed on our website. I really encourage you to check it out. It can be some great locations for turkey hunting. I knew from scouting that this bird liked to roost about 50 yards or so back in that tree line, back behind where my, my son is. And he would gobble a couple times in the tree, fly down into that field, and then he wouldn't gobble very much the rest of the morning. Instead, what he would do is strut around that field and wait for the hens to come to him. Everything could see where he was, the hens knew where he was. Uh, so we set up along a tree line, put a decoy out in that field. When it got light, he gobbled a few times. We just gave him a few soft calls. Everything was working as if he expected it to. He flew down into the field, saw the decoy, came over and my son was able to get him. That's what scouting can do, is it can give you that kind of information that really just pays off when the season starts. It's it's Scouting is the great equalizer. You don't have to be a, the best caller. You don't have to have the best shotgun, shoot the best shells, have the newest camouflage. If you have scouting, um, if you have knowledge that you've obtained from scouting, you're better off than anybody who has all those things because you know where the turkeys are, you, knew, you know what they like to do, and then you use that information to your advantage. It can really help you in the long run. So that concludes our presentation for tonight. I hope you found it beneficial and we'll be happy at this time to answer any questions that you might have. I don't know why it does. Okay, everyone, I'm having some issues of getting this slide to come up for you. Why? Okay. We're gonna go with this for right now. <laughs> Let's see if I can fix it as we go along here. All right, so thank you, Steve and Ken. Um, we are going to take a few minutes now to answer questions. Um, if you have a question about turkey hunting, please feel free to type it into the question section of the panel. Um, the first question that I have is for Ken, and it is, should I set up my blind a few days before I go turkey hunting or the day of? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and most people who deer hunt out of a blind know you should set it up well in advance because deer can be afraid of new things out there. Uh, and that's good general advice for turkeys too, but it, it does seem like turkeys are not 
um, as concerned about ground blinds as deer are. So um, you can get away with setting it up um, the day before or as when you get in in the morning. Uh, and this is often a good strategy too uh, for when Steve was talking about having backup places. You may only have one blind. Uh, you can bring your blind to these backup locations and still set it up and, and still be successful. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question I have is for Steve. What if I can't get out to scout in the morning and only can get out in the afternoon or the evening? Okay, that is a great question. And I understand that's a, a dilemma that we all face from time to time. Uh, if turkeys are in the area, they're generally gonna be in the same area, be it morning, afternoon, evening. Uh, the benefit of morning is that's when they tend to be more vocal. So that's why I really recommend being there in those morning uh, times when, as the sun's coming up here where they are. But if, if that's not an option, again, the turkeys are still going to be in the area. I'm just going to key in on looking for that sign that I talked about, looking for the scratchings, seeing if there's food around, looking for tracks. Uh, you'll see if a flock comes through, sometimes they'll uh, leave a feather or two. Any kind of indication that they are still there is going to be helpful. I'm also probably going to rely more on the on the locator calls, um, especially the crow. And right about now, if if I was uh, checking a spot, I'd be using an owl hoot to see if I could get a shock gobble uh, from a gobbler who's on the roost. Uh, they tend to do that. They're prone to do that. Um, just like in the morning, a loud noise can cause them to shock gobble. Uh, right as the, uh, the sun's going down and they're going to roost, uh, they're known to uh, let out a gobble or two. Again, they're still in that area. They're just not going to be as, as vocal as they are in those morning times. But if you're looking for the sign, if you're using locator calls, uh, there's still a good chance that you'll know they're around. Um, and I, I definitely recommend that, even if you can't get out in that peak morning time period, uh, you know, make the use of uh, the best of what you have. And if that means getting out in the afternoons and evenings, uh, there's still a lot of benefit to do so. Okay, thank you. The next question I have is for Ken. What if I have more success in the spring calling hens into my set? Uh, good question. Uh, first, don't shoot any of the hens. Uh, that's that's key. Um, as I mentioned before, they should have a beard. Um, but hens do um, come in in spring. You are sometimes able to call them in. It's, it's not as readily as gobblers, but you can. Uh, what I suggest with that is to, to let them sit there in your set. Um, you're not going to do a better job of imitating a hen than a real one does. Um, so if you got hens sitting in your set, uh, attracting all the gobblers, take advantage of that and, and let them call them in for you. Okay, thank you. Steve, what should I do if I accidentally bump into turkeys? Okay, um, another great question. Um, I think sometimes as turkey hunters, we like to think that uh, we give turkeys almost the ability of humans to reason out. And we think if if we bump into them one time that they're gonna think, oh, that's right, turkey season is right around the corner. I better get out of the area. Uh, that's not that's not always the case. They, they are instinctive animals. They react to what they perceive to be danger. So if I bump into a turkey one time um, as I'm walking through the woods, accidentally bump into it, it's, it's really not too different than how that turkey goes about a, on a normal day. Uh, I've seen turkeys uh, get scared by a deer, a deer snorting or a deer running through the woods will cause a turkey to turn and run. And what is more, you know, what is possibly more natural than a deer? And yet even a deer will spook a turkey. A turkey lives its life constantly in fear of a predator, constantly thinking that it's being hunted. So everything, everything literally can spook a turkey. So uh, that being said, Running accidentally bumping into a turkey once, it's probably not going to cause too much too much disruption in that turkey's daily routine. Uh, chances are that turkey multiple times throughout the day will will encounter things that'll that'll scare it. It's when it becomes more consistent. It's when it's more prolonged. It's when it's not just simply bumping into a turkey and then turning uh, me turning and getting out of the area, but more, you know, continuing to walk, scattering the flock. 
those are the things that I'm trying to avoid. I want to make sure that as it gets closer and closer to the season, those turkeys are as uh, undisturbed as possible. So uh, there's no way to spend time in the woods scouting and, and not bump into a turkey. It's going to happen. My goal is just to minimize the number of times that it does happen. And if it does happen, I'm just going to uh, quietly sit down, let the turkey get out of there, and then I'm going to get out of there, give the give the area a day or two to, or even longer to calm down, and then go back to scouting it. Okay, thank you. All right, so I don't sure who would prefer to answer this one, um, Steve or Ken. We got the question is, what is the best call ever? Maybe you guys might want to take turns giving your preference. Sure, I'll, I'll give my opinion because I think this is a great question and it's a subjective one. So I'll give my opinion and, and Ken, uh, please feel free to give yours as well. Uh, for me, if there's one call that I'm going to learn ahead of the season and then uh, utilize in a hunting situation, uh, my go-to is a cut on a box call. I found that that cutting sound, which uh, is a hen who's got some sense of urgency in her voice, it's more of a of a desperation or irritation, but it's it's uh, goes above and beyond a yelp, and there's a there's an intensity to it. Um, I found as a hunter, um, and can vividly remember my first year walking through an area yelping, not getting any response, and then. I just sat down and, and decided I'm going to figure out this cutting thing. And I spent a couple minutes working on that cutting and boom, instantly a gobbler responded. It was, it was as if uh, I'd flipped a switch. And I, ever since then, uh, my go-to is going to be a nice hard cut on a box. I think it generates uh, the gobblers and it, it really grabs their attention. It's, it's, again, it's that hen saying, I'm here with more intensity in her voice than a normal yelp. Uh, so Ken, I'll let you weigh in on that. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, I I really like the Yelp. Um, I think it's it's easy to learn um, and easy to do, um, and it is one of the most common calls that hen turkeys will make. So that's that's what I would recommend. Certainly, the cut is great too. But I think probably one of the more important things um, is no call at all. Um, if you call too much, that is not natural. Um, so learning when to call and when not to call. And, and generally, um, I like to err on the side of not calling that often. If I get a, a bird's attention, I'll call just enough to get his attention and get him moving to me. And then I'll try to stay quiet uh, unless I need to help direct him back in. But for the most part, uh, I think silence is a really important call. Okay, thank you. Um, Steve, is it better to scout in the woods or fields? Okay, that's really a, a function, a feature of what uh, kind of terrain that you're gonna be hunting. For me personally, I hunt um, mostly state game lands with an occasional uh, public access property that has a field or two. So I do the vast majority of my scouting in the woods, um, I tend to prefer that. I tend to uh, just, I have a better feel for it. I, I, I like knowing the terrain, the topography, where the turkeys are roosted, and then, that, then using that to my advantage. Uh, that being said, I've certainly hunted fields before, been successful on it. What is uh, good with a field is it's easy to scout uh, more so from afar. If I know I'm going to be hunting a field, I tend to uh, mainly rely on binoculars. I, I won't risk getting too close to that field. Uh, so if if the terrain permits, I'm gonna and I'm scouting a field. I'm gonna try to get up onto a high location um, and use the binoculars and spend some time watching that field because chances are, if there's a gobbler who likes to frequent it, if there's a gobbler who comes out and struts in that field, um, I'd rather be a, a, a back a good distance and just watch him through my binoculars. But uh, again, it's it's really a feature of the a question of the where you particularly like to do your hunting, where you plan on doing your hunting. Uh, but for me, um, all things being told, I just enjoy being in the woods. I, I like the fact that I can get away with a little more movement, 
um, with, given that there's cover around me and whatnot. So uh, most of my scouting um, is going to take place in the wooded, wooded uh, setting. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ken, do turkeys roost in the same spot year after year? Uh, certainly they can, um, but remember, um, I guess the uh, gobbler only lives on average to about three in Pennsylvania. Um, so, and, and most of what you're hunting are gobblers themselves. Uh, most people do, tend not to hunt jakes that often. So, um, if you're dealing with a gobbler, you probably only have him for one or two seasons. So it may seem like they're moving around, um, but that's just maybe because it's actually different birds. Okay. I have another question for you, Ken. Is it possible to harvest a turkey in the early afternoon? Yes, and in fact, people do. Um, in the, after the second week of the season, we open it up so that you can hunt afternoon, and uh, people do kill turkeys uh, during that part. Uh, it's not certainly not as many as those in the morning, uh, but people are still successful. Uh, I would say your tactics could probably change a little bit with that, um, focusing more on food um, instead of trying to find that gobbler who's looking at their hens. Um, so your tactics change a little bit, but you can still be successful. Okay, thank you. Um, Steve, how long would you work a turkey before moving on to another? Okay, um, and like like the answer I feel like we've given a, a lot these seminars is it really it really depends. It, it's a great question. It's one that everybody who's worked a bird is wondering that question of how much time should I spend on this particular bird or should I move to another one? For me, uh, a lot of factors go into that. Um, first of all, do I have all morning to hunt or is this, uh, you know, it, do I have to get to work in an hour? In, in that instance, if I have a bird in front of me, I'm, I'm not going to leave it, I'm gonna stick with it. But if I have more opportunities, if, if I've taken the whole day to hunt, um, I'm, I'm cognizant of how easy it is to burn up an entire day, an entire morning, even an entire season on a bird that doesn't want to come to you for whatever reason. And it might be uh, because he has plenty of hens with him and he's not interested in uh, going to find the one that won't come to him. So I'm really gonna be taking the temperature of that bird. How interested is he in coming to my location? And what I have found is a bird that doesn't have hens with him. And I, I, I'm gonna be generalizing, but a bird that doesn't have hens with him, I'm probably gonna know that pretty soon based on how mobile he is. If he's cut the distance to me a little bit, uh, if he's moving in the area, if I can hear tell he's he's responding from one spot, then responding from another spot, and then maybe back again. If he's being mobile uh, more than just a few yards or so, but if he's moving through the forest, responding to my calls, chances are that's a bird I'm going to want to stick with uh, for a good bit of time because he might not have hens with him and he might be uh, essentially just uh, checking to see if I, you know, check, checking me out as well. Uh, he's being a little wary as as every turkey we hunt in Pennsylvania is going to be. But he's, uh, so he hasn't thrown, thrown caution to the wind, but he's definitely interested. He's uh, come close a few times and then backed out. Chances are what he's doing is he's walking around and strutting. Because we have to remember uh, what nature has designed is that those hens come to the gobbler when he gobbles. So he's, uh, but if he's still responding to me and he's walking around strutting, I still have his interest. I'm going to work that bird uh, for a significant period of time. That's the bird that I'm willing to invest uh, potentially the rest of the morning in because I feel like I have a good chance of killing him, killing that bird. The ones that I'm going to probably move away pretty quickly, these are the ones that aren't responding to a call. You know, might have to call four or five times to just get a half-hearted gobble. They haven't moved. They're always in the same location. Those, to me, that, that signals that's a bird that has some hens with them. That bird's not interested in, in responding. So what I'm generally going to do is, is go walk around, find a different bird. And if, if I left that bird early on in the morning and I have all day, I'm going to come back through that area late morning because there's a really good chance that by late morning, 
um, the reason that he wouldn't come in, which is those hens, there's a good chance those hens have now gone to nest. And all of a sudden that bird's going to be lonely. And it, it's amazing how a bird that in early in the morning sounded like he wanted nothing to do with your calls can be incredibly responsive the minute that they are without hens. Uh, so that's those are the factors that I'm going to be thinking about when when sitting there trying to make that decision like we all have to do of how long, how much time should I invest in those gobbler? I'm going to be thinking about those factors. Okay, thank you. Um... Ken, what part of Pennsylvania seems to have more turkeys harvested? Uh, good question. So uh, the more turkeys are harvested, are going to have areas where there are more turkeys. So that's that's the first answer to that. Um, and, and where you're going to find more turkeys are where you have good turkey habitat and at a large scale. So places where there are hay fields mixed in with forest and mixed in with ag that's really provides the best kind of landscape large area that turkeys are going to look at or uh, really thrive in uh, so in pennsylvania some of our western wildlife management units are some of our better ones for example 2d uh, 1a um, and those are can be really good uh, we also see some in up in 3c has a pretty high harvest density which is number of birds per square mile um, some of our lower densities are um, are in 5C or 5B, and, and not many birds harvested in and around uh, Philadelphia. But in general, um, if you, that's in general, if you were looking for specific state game land, state forests are great places to go and find turkeys, uh, no matter where you're at in the state. There may not be as many, but um, sometimes it's better to hunt close to you than to to travel a long way. Okay, I have a question for Steve. Um, what are you looking, I mean, sorry, what are you looking for if you were looking at a map like Google Maps or Onyx for scouting? Okay, a couple things that I'm going to be looking for. Uh, one is I want to see if there's any trails in the area. Um, I've talked several times about uh, the importance of trying to um, not make too much of a disturbance when you're going into an area. So a trail, um, a logging road is a great asset. That way I can, I know I'll be quieter than say if I was just walking through the area in the dark, you know, stumbling over rocks, breaking sticks. So I'm going to look for ways to access the property. Is there a trail, a logging road, anything like that, that I can use to my advantage? Um, then I'm going to look at the topography of the land itself. And I'm going to be looking for uh, where are the steep spots? Where are the ridges? Where's the top of a mountain? Where's the top of a hill? Because those are the, the places that I'm going to want to get to. Uh, again, particularly in the dark, in those early morning uh, time frame, it, my, my biggest thing that I'm looking for is how can I get to those high points of this property um, and do so as close to being undetected as possible? And usually a map is going to give me a, a lot of those answers and um, uh, give me a, some reasons going in, some, some things to look for. Also, uh, looking for just uh, property lines, particularly if I'm hunting a state game lands, a state forest, anything that borders some private property. Um, I'm going to be cognizant of where I am in that property in relative to where private property might be. The last thing I want to be, do, be doing is trespassing on somebody's property, particularly in the dark, stumbling through an area uh, where I don't belong with a flashlight. It, that's just a, a recipe for a disaster and something I want to avoid. So I'm looking for those property lines. I'm also looking for creeks. Um, is there a pond, any body of water in the area? This is just good information for me to have in the back of my head. Um, I'm looking also if I'm hunting a field around a field is where's there a fence line, any type of those features uh, because turkeys will use the topography to their advantage. And if, if you're in one spot, but there's a creek between you and that turkey, that turkey chances are isn't crossing that creek. If there's a fence row, um, even a fence row that a turkey could very easily hop over, uh, they're very stubborn and, and they'll be very reluctant to do so. So I'm getting that bird's eye view, just looking for unique features of the property uh, but primarily I'm looking for, is there a trail, logging road, a nice easy way to slip into that property? And then where are the places I'm going to want to get to so that I can go up high and listen?
Okay, I have another question for Steve. Are decoys worth the expense and what type should I buy, gobbler or hen? Okay, uh, great question. And um, I'll give my opinion on this and then Ken, absolutely feel free to jump in as well. I think decoys absolutely are worth the expense. Um, what I've seen a decoy have the ability to do is get that gobbler, especially an older bird, who knows where you're calling from. He knows there should be a hen in that area. Um, and if he comes to that ex exact spot where he expects to see a hen and does not see a hen, uh, for an older bird, an older gobbler, that can be a deal breaker. He, chances are he knows there's something not right about this situation and he's out of there. Uh, so a, a, a nice hen decoy can absolutely make a gobbler commit. It reassures him that, yes, there's a hen in the area, just like I thought there is. Let me now close the distance and come within shotgun range. So uh, what I like to do is have that hen decoy um, out in an area where uh, the gobbler will see it. And when he sees it and, and uh, again, closes the distance, now he's in range where I can, can take that gobbler. Um, that being said, uh, I've also seen decoys um, work against me from time to time. And one time I had a, a bird that saw the decoy and he wasn't going to come any closer because he knew that decoy should be coming to him. So it set up a long uh, two hour standoff between me and that gobbler because he would not budge waiting for what he thought was a hen to come to him. Again, it's, it's like so many other situations we've talked about, it's impossible to predict what exactly a, a gobbler will do in every situation. But that being said, odds are, um, if I had to decide between buying a decoy and um, using one or not using one throughout the year, I'm going to I'm going to go with a decoy just because I've seen how effective they can be at calming down that gobbler and getting him to take those last couple of steps. Yeah, I'll chime in here too, and I, I agree. Decoys can be incredibly effective. They can help steer gobblers to where you want them to to go. Uh, I've had been in situations where I wasn't using a decoy and he ended up moving off to the side to a point where I wasn't able to shoot or see him anymore. Um, and a decoy could have helped draw him into where I was aiming. Um, but just like Steve, uh, a couple of years ago, I was on a pipeline, had a turkey gobbling, set out a decoy, and he hung up 100 yards from me on that pipeline because he could see that decoy. And he st strutted and gobbled his head off, but would not get any closer. Um, and it was another two hour ordeal that was a ton of fun, but also a little frustrating. And I think that was a case where, yeah, maybe if I didn't have the decoy, I probably could have got him to come closer. Um, but in general, yeah, I think, I think they're very, very useful. Okay, we had a similar question um, that I just want to make sure we answer that as well. The question was, when would you use a Tom decoy over a hen decoy? I'll, I'll take the first stab at this one, Ken, um, and then, of course, feel feel free to chime in. I, I'm i not, uh, particularly for me, I, I'd probably stay away from using another gobbler decoy, particularly a mature Tom decoy. Um, just because they have the potential to have the reverse effect. When a gobbler is coming in, he sees a mature gobbler decoy. It's going to do one or two things for him. Uh, it might irritate him. He might think that Tom has no business being around my hen, and he might rush in coming for a fight. Or he might say, I've been beaten up all spring by a, a mature Tom that looks just like that one. I'm getting out of here. Uh, so I think you're going to get one or two reactions from a gobbler when it sees what potentially what in its mind is going to be a, a rival. Uh, again, if this is a, 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 a turkey that's um, lower on the pecking order and did not establish itself throughout the spring, seeing uh, a potential Rival in its area is is not uh, going to get the reaction that you want. So for me, if I'm using a male turkey do decoy, I'm going with a Jake. A Jake, uh, that's that uh, one-year-old gobbler. He's really low in the pecking order. And um, a mature Tom that sees a Jake, 
uh, interfering in his mind with one of his hens, he's going to come in um, and he's uh, going to be looking for that hen, but he's also going to be looking to reestablish himself and take care of that Jake. So if, uh, you know, as it relates to decoys, absolutely, I'd, I'd prefer a hen. And if I'm using a, a male decoy, for me, I'm going with a Jake. Yeah, I agree completely. I would use a Jake um, over a gobbler decoy um, because, because like you said, um, any any gobbler is going to easily be able to beat up a Jake, but um, maybe scared of another uh, mature gobbler. Uh, for me, I don't really use uh, male turkey decoys because I'm mostly hunting public land and I hunt places that can have be crowded. So I would just rather not uh, carry around uh, something with red and white head or a beard um, and have that near me when I'm hunting just from a safety standpoint. Um, but uh, if you're finding places where you, are, you know you're going to be alone, uh, that, that wouldn't be a concern for me. But um, just for my personal preference and safety, I, I tend to leave the male decoys at home. Okay, great. And Ken made a really good point that I just want to expand on. During turkey season, you should not wear red, white, or blue because it may look like a gobbler in the woods and we don't want to have any accidents. So that's just a general rule of safety um, while you're out this spring. Um, we did have another follow-up question to that, so I'm going to go ahead and ask it before we move on to another topic. Um, is there a specific number of decoys that you should put out? Um, is one enough, or do you need more? Um, what do you guys think? I'll go ahead and start. Um, I usually hunt pretty far away from a parking lot, so I don't like to carry too many things with me. So I, I, I usually, if I'm taking a decoy, I'm just going to take one just because it's lighter and easier to carry. And, and I'm right there with you. For me, it's, it's one, it's lighter. Um, also, it's uh, easier on my uh, credit card bill. Uh, decoys, especially uh, right now, they are incredibly lifelike and you can get some uh, pretty expensive decoys and one will absolutely do the trick. Um, when I'm calling to a gobbler, I'm, I'm not going to be sounding like multiple birds generally. I'm just going to sound like one hen. I want to sound like one lonely hen that's, you know, looking for that gobbler. So one decoy, uh, you know, is absolutely all I'm going to uh, rely on, and it's, it's, it's plenty. Okay, thank you. Um, Steve. How often should you use a call when you first get into the woods? Are you walking and using the hooter or go to one location and wait? Okay, um, you know, we're, at this point we're talking about locator calls, right? So how often would you lose, use a locator call? Remember that locator call, what you're trying to get from the gobbler is that shock. Um, that shock effect. It's it's startling to the gobbler to hear that loud noise. Uh, so what I found, what has worked for me is if I'm relying on that locator call too much, the shock value is going down. If the gobbler's hearing uh, an owl hoot every minute or two, he's probably not going to be shocked by it the next time he hears it and then respond. So I'm going to I use my locator calls very uh, sparingly for that reason. I'm going to uh, let um, let the sun come up, let the turkeys do their thing, hopefully uh, let uh, the owls naturally call to each other, let the first crow of the morning go across the valley. I'm going to let all that happen and hear where the turkeys are uh, on their own. But if, if I'm not getting the response or if I think I hear one and just want to make sure that that I can pinpoint where exactly he is, then I'm going to be using my locator call, and I'm going to do it very sparingly. Like I said, I, I, I don't recommend uh, using it too frequently, or it, or it, uh, I, th I think it loses that shock value. So just uh, once or twice is natural. You're probably going to get that response from the gobbler, and that's what I'm going to be doing. Okay, great. Um, Ken, 
since turkeys change their roosting spot daily, is there a direction they tend to go in for the next couple days of roosting? Or is there some kind of pattern? What should people look for there? Yeah, I don't, I don't think there really is much of a pattern. So there, there's a couple of reasons why they change roost sites. One is to continue to avoid predators. If you're always in the same spot, those predators are going to be able to key in on that spot. The other reason is to find hens. Uh, so they're moving around in what's called their home range, which is the area that they typically use in the spring. And it can be up to four square miles during the spring. So they're moving around in that area and they're setting up their roost, trying to find new hens. So if they're not seeing any hens in one area, they move, may move to another area, again, to trying to find those hens. Thank you. Okay, so I also have the question of how far away should you be when scouting? Okay, I'll instead of uh, giving a specific distance, what I'll say is I want to be far enough away uh, where I'm not at risk of being seen. So I, I you know, we've established that I, I'm not going to disturb the turkey, uh, but at the same time. I can generally um, identify where I believe he, he is. Uh, so I'll, t I'll take uh, this this morning, for instance. I was out scouting this morning. Um, I was walking across the, the side of a mountain, and I could hear a gobbler uh, sort of echoing throughout the valley. I knew there was one around, but I could not tell ex uh, even any idea where exactly he might be. Uh, so I did what I typically wouldn't do, and that is I, I went even closer. I, I, I went da further down the mountain and around the side, just trying to get to a position where I could hear more clearly where I thought the sound was coming from. So I went down the trail a little further. And when I did, um, for whatever reason now, I, I must have had a, like a clear line of sight to where, where he was down below me. And then I could hear him in great detail um, answering every time a crow went over uh, this, he was very vocal this morning, and I knew in my mind it, pretty much exactly where he was located at this point. And that's that's what I'm looking for. I'm close enough uh, where it's not just that I know one's in, generally speaking, the area, but I have a more dif uh, more concrete idea where in the area he is. But I'm far enough away that uh, I wasn't risk uh, at any, any risk of bumping him from where I was. So. Those are those are the things that I'm keeping in mind. Close enough to be able to pinpoint him, but uh, far enough far enough away that he couldn't see me, and I could slip back out of there and down to my vehicle. Okay, thank you. Um, so, what is the importance of scratching versus calling? I think they're both uh, really important. That scratching to me, especially in late March, early April, that scratching to me, that tells me that uh, they're in the area and they found food. And we know, we know uh, just like us, you know, turkeys need food to survive. So if I find uh, scratchings, I'm fairly confident, particularly if they're fresh scratchings, if I can tell that the leaves have just been raked away, the ground's bare, it's fresh dirt underneath, uh, to me, that's that's a really good indicator that those turkeys have found food in the area. Uh, they're there for a reason, um, and they're probably going to continue to be. Um, and then it's for me, it's the second part of it is just that uh, hearing them vocalize to each other, hearing them calling back and forth. Uh, that's just confirms uh, what my eyes have seen, and um, that, um, I'll know that they are for sure in the area. But to me, those two really go hand in hand. I'm looking for those scr those scratchings in uh, early spring late winter and then as this as the month of april progresses um, i'm tuned into where exactly they are in that area and I'm, I'm listening to them vocalizing back and forth to each other okay i think that is most of the questions and we want to be respectful of everybody's time um, tonight we will follow up in the coming days with an email with answers to remaining questions, additional resources to help you get started turkey hunting, and a link to the recording of this webinar. 
Um, just a friendly reminder, we'll be hosting another webinar on April 18th with Matt Moret, Champion Turkey Caller and Marketing Bureau Director, to discuss tips and tactics for turkey hunting. For those interested, you can register for the webinar at the link on the screen or by searching Learn to Hunt on our webpage at www.pgc.pa.gov. Um, I would like to thank Steve and Ken for sharing their expertise and time with us tonight. And uh, we also like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us, and we hope you'll visit us again to learn more about hunting, trapping, and wildlife conservation in upcoming web webinars. <laughs> Have a good night, everyone.